Good morning. Um, yeah, I love that reading. And uh, Reverend John Lou asked me to give some background about this church, this congregation, and kind of what makes up its DNA. You know, why, do, why are we here? What, what brought us here? What brought us together? So um, I've done a lot of research, and this is the story of how this congregation and Unitarianism came to Austin. Unitarianism was brought to Austin by the Reverend Edwin Miller Wheelock in 1868. There's his picture. Uh, Wheelock was a Harvard-educated lawyer who also graduated from Harvard Divinity School as a Unitarian minister. He was friends with Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he was open to transcendentalism. He served in the Civil War as chaplain in the Union Army and afterward worked with the Freedmen's Bureau in the Gulf Coast area of Louisiana and Texas. He was married and he had two children. His specialty was education. He developed curriculums to teach formerly enslaved children how to read. His work was very effective and in 1868, the governor of Texas moved him to Austin and appointed him as the first superintendent of schools. Now that sounds like a nice progressive career path, but there is really uh, interesting backstory to all of this that makes it really an amazing story. Wheelock was a devoted abolitionist. He was passionate about what we now call human rights and was outspoken about the immoral institution of slavery. Here's a story about that. Soon after he got his first Unitarian ministerial appointment in Dover, Massachusetts, he delivered a stirring sermon supporting the raid on the Federal Armory at Harpers Ferry, Virginia, by fellow abolitionist John Brown. Now, those of you who don't remember every detail of your American history might not remember this, but Brown in October of 19, excuse me, 1859, just before the Civil War, raided the Federal Armory, including or intending to start a slave liberation movement that would spread to the southern states. Um, it didn't seem like it was well planned and the enslaved people that it was meant to liberate didn't exactly know what was going on, so it failed. Brown was tried for treason and was hanged on December 2nd, 1859, the first person executed for treason in the history of the United States. So that's interesting. But Wheelock, our, our friend Wheelock, he wrote a sermon about this, and that made him very famous. He was asked to speak in Boston, and his sermon was printed in newspapers. His sermon was in support of what Brown did. Uh, his, Wheelock's sermon didn't pull any punches on the topic of slavery. Here's a quote from it. Withholding the key of knowledge, abrogating the marriage relation, rending families asunder at the auction block makes the state that protects it a band of pirates and the church that enshrines it a baptized brothel. And he said lots of things like that through, this, through, that, uh, through that sermon. The state of Virginia put a $1,500 bounty on his capture, dead or alive, for treason. They wanted to try him for treason for saying those things. Well, luckily for Wheelock, the Civil War broke out in 1861. <laughs> <laughs> He immediately enlisted and became a chaplain in the Union Army. That's how he got appointed to uh, work with the Freedmen's Bureau during uh, Reconstruction. But think about it. Here is a man who was once hated throughout the South, somehow able to work with both the southern Gulf states and the federal government to do something that the people of the South found unimaginable, teaching reading to those that they had enslaved. Well, he was able to do it and do it successfully. And he got a high-ranking position in Texas from, the, from Governor Pease, who himself was a former slave owner. Wheelock had some pretty mighty diplomatic skills. Uh, he served in a number of high-ranking jobs in Texas government, including the superintendent of, of the School for the Blind, our good neighbors back here. Uh, he was a really uh, charismatic man. Uh, Texas was not really ready for liberal religion at that time, and Wheelock, and Wheelock knew that. But he went to Spokane, Washington in 1887 to form the Unitarian Society of Spokane, and he served as its minister there for two years. He came back to Austin, I guess he was inspired by that experience, he came back to Austin and in 1891 started a Unitarian ministry here, always speaking up for 
the oppressed and against monopolies and uh, conglomerates. That ministry survived Wheelock's death in 1901. He died in 1901 at the age of 72. And uh, that ministry continued through uh, the end of World War I. Uh, now, Reverend Wheelock's daughter, Emily, carried the mantle of Unitarianism in Austin after her father's death and for the rest of her life. And from what I've gathered, she had a lot of her father's diplomacy and courage. Emily was married to a British man by the name of John Housen, who was associated with the International Great Northern Railroad and the Austin National Bank. He was moneyed, let's say. Uh, they had one child who died as an infant in 1889. Uh, Emily's great social justice passion was for getting the vote for women. She was involved in every organization that promoted women's rights, and, and she was a, a leader of many of them. Emily was a charter member of the Austin Women's Club and was involved in the formation of the Texas Federation of Women's Clubs. After years of working towards women's suffrage, Emily was 59 years old when the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. Unitarianism survived quietly, evolving after World War II into the Community Church of Austin, which ceased in the winter of 1951 when it morphed into the Unitarian Fellowship of Austin. Services were held in people's homes initially, and after and among the founding members was Emily Wheelockhausen, who was by then 90 years old. Emily called in all of her favors to get things jump-started for this church. I think she knew it was her last hurrah. The YWCA gave this fellowship space to meet. The Texas Federation of Women's Clubs did the same. Uh, other women's organizations gave equipment and administrative assistance. Finally, in 1954, the Unitarian Fellowship of Austin had grown strong enough to call its first minister and became incorporated as the first Unitarian Church of Austin. That's where we get the 1954 date. There were 66 families committed to the new church with 81 members, and it was continuing to grow. It, continu it just continued to grow. Sadly, in 1957, Emily Wheelock Housen died. She was 96 years old. But she, but she wasn't done helping this congregation. She left this congregation a legacy of $100,000, uh, equivalent to about a million dollars today. Maybe more, depends on, they use it to buy land. Uh, they use it to purchase the land that uh, this church was built on, this site. And the building was dedicated in January of 1961 with Housen Hall named in Emily's honor. As an aside, uh, this property was purchased in 1960 for $20,000. <laughs> and the building, which was just the Housen Hall part, uh, cost $86,100 to build. Reverend Wheelock and his daughter Emily played key roles in forming this church, but they were not the only ones. It was their spirit their determined commitment to the spiritual practice of social justice that, that helped inspire others, and I'm certain they were inspired by many people. After House and Hall was built in 1961, the classroom wing was built in 1968, and in 1987, this beautiful sanctuary was added. There are many stories about the things that have taken place here, many people who've worked toward compassion and justice, in this place from racial integration to LGBTQ rights, moral treatment of immigrants and refugees, reproductive justice, the list just goes on. Um, in, in, <laughs> are you looking at that? Yeah, in 1961, in 1961, the, uh, the, uh, when the initial, initial church building was built, the Austin American Statement published this article, Unitarian Service Features Dancing. I'm sure that caused a collective clutch of the pearls around the city. <laughs> but little did they know, we were just getting started. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.